Thank you. All right. Er uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, the December 20th, 2023 Northampton Urban Forestry Commission. Um, and we can start out with public comment. Uh, and Kent, I know you're a member of the public, but you're like family now, so I don't <laughs> probably going to hold your comments to your little to your presentation. Um, I don't have anything else. Okay. Um, okay. No public comment. Um, if uh, uh, did review and approve the minutes of eleven fifteen. I don't know if folks had time to look at those. Molly's did, did Jen. I'm good. I'm just finishing up. Okay, let, let us know, Sue or David, when you're done. I've looked at them. I'm, I'm finished. Okay. All right, Sue, what's up to you? Okay, I'm done. All right. Um, can we have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? I so move. All right. Can we have a second, please? Jen is the second. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Bonnie, could we have a roll call, please? Absolutely. Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Molly? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. David? Yep. And no Rich and no Jordan? Correct. Um, okay, so tree warden report. So I have a couple of things and I have a, I just... I wanted to make you aware of a project that's coming down the pipeline that uh, was um, not in my wheelhouse until it was actually after our, our after our last regular schedule meeting. I got an email from National Grid uh, requesting um, that I look at about 30 public shade trees on Turkey Hill Road that uh, may or may not need to be removed to upgrade the electrical utilities at the top of Turkey Hill Road uh, because they're building, if anyone's been at the top of Turkey Hill Road, there's a very large, mm -hmm. there's a du um, a duplex there that exists on the left-hand side and there was plans to build other duplexes there, but that was shelved for whatever reason. Now the plans have been um, been resurrected and the du there is gonna be a duplex constructed on the other side of that one. Um, but it requires um, electrical upgrades because there's not enough electricity um, distribution lines available or distribution um, network available. So I haven't been up there yet. <clears throat> they National Grid, I did email them back and I actually had a phone conversation with the arborist from Grid, the local arborist. And um, they sent me a list. They tagged all the trees that they need to have removed and I need to go and sort of sort through it all and that was my plan this week but then this rainstorm came and that sort of changed the dynamics of operations for this week and it's also a short week because we're off on Friday so mm -hmm. I'll have um I'll have uh more of an update at our next meeting which would be January Besides just looking at the trees, what what actions are possible upshots? Um, pay, so, they have to pay? Yes, they, they will. The, yes, they have to abide by the the rules and regulations that we have in the mitigation chart for the trees that are um, not, you know, the trees that I deem that are healthy that they really need to have removed. They have to pay for them. The trees that I deem that are in poor condition or high risk for failure, that you know might be dead or dying already that need to be removed there is not gonna I, I will not charge them mitigation for that who um, pays national grid uh well no actually unfortunately who's going to pay is the person who's building a, the house oh and i don't think they're aware of that hmm. i have no clue who the person is but because this is a by right construction um initial by right construction but it also received a review from the planning board um and um that project has been in the pipeline for many years, but, but was just sort of put on hold because the property was, I don't know if it was during the last downturn in the economy, it just wasn't viable, you know, wasn't um, affordable for a builder to do another duplex there, but apparently someone is going to build it. I don't know who the person is, but so I have to sort through that and then I'll send National Grid a, a, a list back of the trees that I will allow them to remove uh, without any mitigation and the other trees that will require a public shade tree hearing with full mitigation. 
and then maybe there's some negotiation, some wiggle room um, also, because there are other, there uh, is other work that needs to happen up there. There's about, there's probably about four or five removals on that street that are required because the street unfortunately has a lot of uh, uh, ash trees and also a lot of uh, uh, hemlock trees. Mm -hmm. So maybe Grid will be willing, if they're going to do the removals, maybe they'd be willing to do a few other removals for us um to sort of help us out um on on that end but um I, I haven't done anything with it there's also a whole permitting process that has to happen um with the conservation commission because of the um uh, they need some kind of an easement over conscom property in order to access this uh right uh, yeah no, not great i think the builder the building the builder does i think um so I, i'm not Exactly sure. I've been in contact with Sarah LaValle, but I'm waiting for more details. Uh, one other question about that. So since they're they're taking out these trees that are in the path of an underground electrical conduit, right? No, this is all it's going to be overhead. Oh. So what they have to do is they have to they have to increase their distribution capacity overhead to a oh, certain okay. point. And then okay. from that point it goes underground. I have not seen a plan. Um, I don't know where it goes underground. Um, it, I think it goes underground at the end of the street and then goes under the driveway. Um, but the problem is, is that at the top of Turkey Hill, it's a dead end and there's only so many properties. So they have to put in new poles that can carry um, heavier wire and a, a more transformers because they have to really basically up the um, voltage that goes up the street in order to supply another home. Mm. Um, so that's... You know, there's only so many houses can, that can be on one step down transformer. And mm -hmm. I think that they're maxed out. So, you know, and grid <clears throat> grid has a, a responsibility, a legal responsibility to provide the electricity to buildings. So, you know, they're doing their due diligence by contacting me ahead of time and trying to get this sorted out. Um, so I'll I'll have more information for you. I was up there on Sunday and I did notice a lot of trees with orange flags around them. Those would be the ones. Yep. And again, they're telling me they're in the public right away, but the top of Turkey Hill Road is like no man's land. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's really no surveys that exist. It's uh, oh. so it's going to be um, I'll have to use the individual property plans to sort of figure it out. And maybe some of the trees are not even in the public right away. So. Mm. So there's that. And then I wanted just to give you a quick update on Monday. You all know we had a tremendous amount of rain. Um. We lost one tree on Round Hill Road, um, and we lost, um, we're going to have to cut down another pine tree on Hatfield Street. Had a, a co-dominant stem uh, fall off and actually fell backwards into the Coach Light apartment yard. Ooh. Luckily, it missed the building, but it was, I think, at that maximum wind gust we had uh, that was about 50 miles an hour, but we... Um, <clears throat> we were very fortunate. Um, we did not really have the wind that they anticipated. Um, although we did have a lot of rain, and as I told you earlier, that the trees at Florence Fields were trying to walk away, um, but uh, we put them back in the ground and we restaked them, so hopefully they'll be okay. There was flooding. Um, you're probably aware of like West Street was closed for a day uh, due to the stop log structure had to be installed. Uh, and then we, Mains Field, which was flooded in the summer, got flooded again. Mm. So this is twice in one year in my whole 34 year career twice that the mains field has been wiped out mm, one year. Yeah. So it's, I mean, if uh, we can use that as a marker to understand um, the difference in our weather patterns and our overall climate here, that's a pretty good indication. So um, the other thing I wanted to make mention was that uh January, and I I will, I, re, I will remind you, January uh, 9th and 10th is the Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters um, annual conference in Sturbridge. So um, Dr. Francesco Farini from Florence, Italy is going to be our keynote speaker. Um, I'll say, I don't, did I send you the brochure? Did I not send you the brochure? I probably didn't. I'll send it to you after our meeting. I'll make a note right now. Um but I just wanted to let you know that he was going to be there really talking about sustainable um, sustainable uh, urban canopy um, and how to actually uh, create a sustainable canopy and maintain 
and sustain or maintain that canopy. So uh, I think it's going to be a really nice conference, a lot of good information. So that was the other thing. Um, and that is our next meeting is January 3rd. Is everyone going to be available? Mm -hmm. A couple days after the New Year's. <clears throat> Okay, that's mm -hmm. all. Of it. Anyone have any questions? If if not, I would like to turn it over to Kent, if I could. Kent, thank you for coming to the meeting, uh, and thank you for extrapolating that uh, the new data uh, for uh, Northampton's land cover changes. So I made you a, I made you a co-host. If you okay, great. Um, okay. I think I did. Let me just check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Can you see my window, my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is an update of a report that I presented a while ago. So I might skip over some of the things that are not too much changed. Um, it will be on my, it is on my website. This I'm showing a local copy because I made a few last minute changes today, but this will be up on my website soon with the changes. Um, what is your website? So here's, here's the whole one, but if you just go to kentsj.com slash knowhow with a capital oh. N, then okay. you will um, see that the reports that I've, that I've done for this committee. Um, okay. And it's this land cover change 2001 to 2021 is the one I'm presenting tonight, which is an update from okay. cover 2001 to 2019, which I have up here just in case I want to compare. Um, so quick review, this, this is land cover data at 30 meter resolution. So every 30 meter square across Northampton gets categorized as one type of land cover. So it's it's fairly coarse. It comes from this place called the Multi-Resolution Land Characteristics Consortium. They have they did data releases every three years from 2001 to 2019, and then another one in 2021, which is why I'm showing this again. So this is updated with data from 2021, which I did not have the last time I showed this. Um, so. If you take so here's I'm gonna I'll skip this table with the numbers, but here's the, the uh, mm -hmm. chart that shows the overall change in Northampton, and you can see there the trend is continuing of an increase in developed land, a decrease in forested land. A um, little bit odd, this sharp decrease in cultivated land and a sharp increase in in barren land, and I'll I'll talk about that a little bit just because it's mm. kind of like what the heck is this? Um, but mostly it's a continuation of the trends that we saw the last time I um, I made this. And again, even though this chart sort of gives the impression that forested land has gone to develop, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. And this chart kind of, it's called a stream chart shows where it's going. So some of the forested land has become developed some has actually turned to herbaceous and shrubland. Um, hmm. And some of the cultivated land has also become developed. And a significant amount of cultivated land has, be, has been reclassified as barren. Um, hmm. So this table gives the numbers behind this. So if you look at forest, out of 145 acres have gone from forest to developed. 80 acres have gone from forest to herbaceous and shrub. A um, little bit has become cultivated. So, that'd be, so you can see this little bit of forest goes to cultivated. You can get the numbers behind that. Um, the cultivated 32 acres have become barren. Yeah, go ahead. I just have a quick question. Um, if if forested area is going to herbaceous shrub, is that because it's been logged? Um, I not sure i can show you some examples and we can try to draw conclusions some of it i know there's a, a fairly good sized area in the um fitz near fitzgerald lake which looks like maybe it's uh, a wetland which has killed killed oh. some forest 
Yeah, gotcha. Oh. Okay. okay, so it could then, be beaver activity changed it. Yeah, yeah. okay. And there's, there's some also when we look at the details, I think um, some of it is kind of, uh, it looks like the snapshot was at an interesting time, like the big solar farm that's off of um, mm -hmm. between Rocky Hill Road and Bird's Pit Road looks like was maybe under construction. So some of that land had possibly been cleared. Mm -hmm. and was looking like shrubland because it was starting to, to grow back up again mm -hmm. when the survey was taken. And I think if we looked at it now, it would be developed. And the, the cultivated to barren seems to be also uh, a good portion of that is fields that maybe were were fallow at the time of the, the survey and were cal were um, classified as barren rather than cultivated. So there's there's kind of some like interpretation maybe that's needed to make sense of this. And and I don't entirely have answers to those questions. The the best place to look at that is in this map, which uh so here this is now showing everything that was classified as forest in 2001 and was classified as something other than forest in 2021 is shown on this map as colored. And similarly to last time we looked at that, there's not that many surprises. This is um, Emerson Circle. This is the two co-housings. This is um, uh, what's called Ice Pond Drive here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, the co-housing at Village Hill. And I guess there was some development at the front of Village Hill. These are some developments along uh, East Hampton Road. This is a um, the uh, self storage that mm -hmm. was, um, I think, expanded. But you can look at this. You can um, it's this this version of the map is good because it shows you the road, so you can kind of figure out well where am I, and then if you want to see well what's actually there, you can zoom in and switch over to the satellite view mm -hmm. and turn off the forest lost. So this is actually a good example because this is, I think, an expansion of the self-storage, which at the time of this photograph, which I don't know when what the date is of these um, satellite photos either, but this is obviously mm -hmm. under construction at this time. So um, you can say, yeah, that's now developed, but at the time of the photo, it was not. And some of the ones, let me show you a few different examples, like if we go up to Oh, it's changed on Fitzgerald Lake. Actually, hmm. if we look at the last one, am I in the right section here? Yeah. So this is the one I did with the 2019 data. And I don't want the rural zone. I want this one. Oh, maybe I'm mistaken. I thought this one did have an area of forest loss in Fitzgerald Lake, but I guess not. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Here's a big area which is listed as going to herbaceous and shrub. And if you look at that, it's like, oh, yeah, it looks like it is for some reason. Maybe it was logged. They, I'm not. They did logging. I can tell because I've looked at it before and after picture of that exact spot. And they okay. did. Look, that's what it is. So I think some of these, you know, you kind of need to use local knowledge to know really what happened there. Um, this is, I think, an expansion in Leeds up, uh, I think it's Chestnut Street. Um, and just to show, I did add today, uh, I wanted to address this strange apparent change from cultivated to barren. So I actually added a layer to this map to show the loss in cultivated. And the, the ones that go to barren, there's quite a bit down here in the Oxbow region. And these do look like probably cultivated fields that were miscategorized although oh. there's also um some i don't know if this marina is new that's the marina since um 2001 but a good chunk of this is also categorized as barren that hmm. i don't know how this was cultivated in the in the middle of the oxbow so some of this is a little bit weird a lot of it does seem to be cultivated land which hmm. um, yeah was categorized as barren at the time of the survey. And then there's also a fair amount, well, that's maybe miscategorized because this is 
um, the, the fields at the oh. Orange Rec area, which I'm surprised they got categorized as developed. Um, it's not cultivated. Well, it's not, it was once cultivated and now it's classified as developed. Yeah. Uh, which I guess maybe that's the right category for. I would say so. That's a, a field. Um, so anyway, you can explore this on your own as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to show, again, I divided it up by zoning categories. These are um, groupings of the city zoning categories that were given to me by uh, Rich, I believe at some point. Anyway, they're not groupings that I created, but um, you can see here's an overview of those zoning categories. And I did this analysis based on each each of them. The rural category, there's actually a slight increase in the last two years, those two years of forest and a decrease in, in um, cultivated. The uh, suburban residential, there's decrease in forest that seems to have gone to herbaceous. Again, there's there's maps associated with each of these also. So if you want to know specifically where the forest loss is there, you can you can look at it. Um, the uh, uh, where are we? The business industrial also has continued to trend. These are fairly small numbers. This is forty acres, so this is actually only seven acres of developed land, and it seems to be actually mostly that expansion of the uh, the self storage out on um, East Hampton Road. If you compare, I was comparing with um, the older one today to try to figure out what that was. And if you look at this map, it doesn't have that expansion on the, the west side of East Hampton Road mm -hmm. that, that this one does. So I think that's probably the bulk of that additional seven acres uh, of forest that's been lost to development in the, uh, in the business industrial zone. Um, so that's kind of quick going some highlights uh, because it, this is a, a repeat of a report I've shown before. I didn't want to go over all the details, but I'm happy to answer questions yeah. and uh, this will be available for, for you to look at on your own if you like um, in the next day or two. I'll, I'll put it up on my website. Sure. Well, and the, the one that's there now is the same, except it doesn't have the... Uh, the cultivated, the extra layer in this this map to show the change in cultivated. Mm -hmm. which I just wanted to add to give us a little bit of. I don't know. This is this is the old one, but the new one that's up here. Um, no, sorry. This one. Oh, well, there we go. It. Because it you know still has the same cultivated to barren. Oh, where's my map? Mm -hmm. Taking a little time to load. Anyway, this map won't have one that's there right now, doesn't have the layer showing the loss of cultivated area. But other than that, the report that's already up there is the same as what I just showed you. Um mm -hmm. so I don't know, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh or go into more detail. So would you say that just ballpark, um, we really haven't seen it, things are fairly stable? I no, mean, the numbers I are small the, enough? Or? The trends are, have, are continuing. OK. Um, you know, if you look at the loss in forest, this is mm. a steady decrease in forest all the way back to uh, 2008, mm -hmm. and a pretty steady increase in developed land. So I would say that it's continuing the trends. Um, some of the subcategories do seem to be fairly stable. The um, developed property in the rural zonings has not changed. It's actually decreased slightly according to this. I mean, very slightly, like 400, 300 of an acre. Um, hmm. So that's maybe stable. Um, um, the suburban residential also, there's no change. Uh -huh. 
it's really, I guess the business industrial is, well, let's see, if we go back up here, how much did it actually change? So 207.7 to 215. So it's actually 14 acres, 15 acres. No, not sorry. Seven or eight acres is the only change in developed mm. acreage. And from 1A to, well, that's a big change, actually. That's about 20, 25, 26 acres lost of forest. But a lot of that went to shrubland. So that's maybe natural progression. It could also be temporary, like on that, that temporary, yeah. That um picture that you showed with the aerial photo that I said I had visited. If they uh -huh. if, if it looked to me like they had done some kind of selective cutting in there and they didn't like clear cut the whole thing. Right. And it doesn't look like it's going to be made into a development. So it will probably grow back into forest. Right. So it's maybe the increase in developed acreage that's more permanent. The interesting um, thing about that, it's not like you said, it's not in the rural and suburban zones. where. So it's not like housing is the problem. It's the industrial big chunks like that um, self-storage thing that takes yeah, out a big that, chunk. That was a big change. I mean, over <clears throat> that was the, seems to be the biggest recent one. Um, I mean, there's a lot of housing in the business industrial zone or significant. I mean, this mm. is um, Village Hill is within that zone. Right. So some of it is housing. This is along industrial drive. So this is um, presumably industrial. But yeah, it's not, there's, there's the big changes in this zone and it's really this one chunk uh, out on East Hampton Road seems to be the major forest loss in the in the last in the, that two year span from 2019 to 2021. It could also be that the size you said it's 30 meters by 30 meters. Is that right? Yes. Um, maybe that wouldn't pick up smaller, you know, houses. Yeah, here. it's a pretty big chunk. And if um, you know, I know there's a lot of concern about tree canopy loss in Bay State, for example. Which, which um doesn't show up here. Right, right. Um, and I don't know if that's been more recent than uh, based than 2021 or, you know, an isolated couple of trees in somebody's backyard that were cut down to make way for an infill development might not show up either. Right, right. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. Kent, could you please go over to um, Stoddard Street? Our street has had a number of infill projects. Sure. Um, let's see. We it's are off prospect. off prospect. There we are. Yeah, that would be one I can oh. identify each property. Yeah, so there's not anything shown on Stoddard Street. Um, and there were well, some trees. This is probably all just shown as developed even back in 2011. Uh, One thing that you can do to investigate something like that, there's a viewer, which I have a link to here. So you can uh, go to this viewer. And uh, find your way to Northampton. <laughs> and Whoa. Helps to turn off some of these layers. These are wonderful, Kent. Wow. Then, oh, this is amazing. Layer. So let's see. This is State Street here. And. Um, oh, uh, yeah. There's Finn. Oh, there's Finn I Street. I see Finn, okay. yeah. So here's Stoddard. There it is, yeah. So then you can come in here and look at the um, 2001 land cover. And it's all developed. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't show any anything that it counted as tree canopy. I mean, there's just, I mean, that's, well, so that answers the question about Bay State. Actually, look, it's entirely shown as developed already in 2001. So this is going to be too coarse to show um, any development there if I, Turn this off, but yeah, this is all based aid here. 
and that's almost wow. entirely different. Can you toggle back and forth between different years of aerial photos? Um, no, and this is actually probably, this is Esri World Imagery. That's the same um, satellite photo that I'm using mm -hmm. in, in mind. So um, no, and again, I don't, let's see if this will tell us anything about what year that is. No. Um, I wonder if you can do that in, in Google Maps or, or Google Earth. Um, I don't know. I know you can go, you can, in Street View, you can go back to earlier years, um, but I don't know that you can do it in the um, the satellite view. Mm. Um, mm. Can you have that open just in case, because it does give it a different view. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I hope it's helpful. It's a little hard sometimes to know what to make of this, but there's, there's a lot, lot to look at. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Kent, if you right on the right on that um the map that's associated with the uh, land cover change right there. Is that supposed to say 2019 or 2020, 2021? Uh, that should be 2021. Yeah, I need to update that. All right. I was just wasn't sure if I was, I actually started looking at your tabs to make sure I was looking at the right thing. So, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll change that. Thank you. Yeah, Ken, this is, Wonderful. And the tab, how you set up all the tabs, it just ex makes so much info accessible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, Actually, it's interesting to poke around and, and, you know, drill down and look like, well, what was, where did, where were these things? It, it is, it is very interesting. And, uh, I really don't know how we would be able to capture any of the by right um, construction that's happened where there's been canopy loss using. Um, I, I, we'd have to, I don't know how we would do that actually using this. Uh, yeah, well, it seems like just from oops, looking at this viewer, that it would be very hard because we know that that's happened in Bay State. Um, any place where this is, showing it has developed in um, 2001, we're not going to see any change. Mm -hmm. um, they, well, there is the tree canopy. So that was a separate report um, that I also did, but this um, tree canopy change might be a better place mm. to look for that because um, this is still at a 30 meter resolution, but instead of giving a single land category at each square, it gives a percentage of tree canopy. Oh. Um, and this, I think, yeah, there's, so here's a map showing percent change as well as some other overlays. Oops, change, that's the one we want. Um, so let's see, I'm a little bit lost. Base state is going to be um, there it is. right there. So that definitely shows uh, a considerable decrease yeah. in canopy uh, across the base state neighborhood, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the colors. So the color green is an increase in canopy and red is a decrease and it becomes oh. more intense. So some of these dots are little rectangles or lots of 100%. Uh, pretty close, yeah. And you can come in here and turn this off and I don't know where this is, Baker Hill Road off of Monotuck Street. 
Mm -hmm. And you can, again, there's a satellite so you can look in, zoom in, wow. see it's there. And so that looks like probably that this house. house was built in that period between 2011 and 2021 and took out all the canopy there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem like it quite lines up. But, hmm. um, there's actually another house in there too. There's been built in there since then. So um, and, um I noticed maybe uh, that's not not shown on this on this satellite view, because again, I don't know the date of the satellite view. Yeah. Hmm. Uh the other thing too is that there was a, a, a sort of a tree clearing operation going on on Barrett Street yesterday. Uh, as you're, uh, you know, where we planted the bald cypresses on Barrett Street on the upper end of Barrett Street, there's yeah. that large field. And then the very end of that field, there's a house nestled in there. Um, I don't know if someone bought the house or, but they had a tree company. I don't know where they're from, but they, they probably at least had 20 to 25 trees topped all ready to be removed all around the house. You know, so they're probably putting in solar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible that uh, <clears throat> that um, I don't. I know the person that used to live there. I don't know if they still live there or not. But um, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I think there's um, because of the by right <laughs> the regulations that we have uh, that allow us to basically change, alter the footprint of our property within the framework of the city's uh, building and zoning code it's kind of it's very hard to regulate what happens on private property sure you know and northampton is a very desirable place to live um you know the one thing that i can see from the previous uh map that kent showed us uh the canopy cover change was that it seems to me that the urban sprawl at the planning uh and sustainability was worried about has not happened um because i think kent you said mm -hmm. that uh, there was an increase in um uh, the rural rural areas uh for uh canopy cover at like two percent yeah that... it looked like um in the rural areas that well it was a very tiny tiny increase and it seemed to be um Mostly coming from cultivated land turning cultivated. into forest. Yeah, so not not necessarily uh, not necessarily developed land. I mean, once once land is developed it, and it's purchased, it pretty much stays developed. It doesn't revert. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, you know, and there's another the other there's another project that project on top of Turkey Hill. There was another project on top of Turkey Hill, which was a by right construction that was a large part of the mountain was you know trees were removed and they had all the appropriate permits from planning sustainability from our stormwater um administrator and our stormwater utility so i mean you know within the, the the systems we have in place to protect tree canopy um and the naturalized properties is it is what it is it's being utilized and it's being enforced it's just that we have a you know a huge building boom going on. I mean, this is everywhere. We're not, we're not the only community that's having this problem, but so th this is good information. I, I do know that um, when your previous report, the 2019 report, uh, we made it available for the public or, or when after we did the presentation, you made it available to the public. Uh, some person from the public went to the city council and utilized this report and basically, um, I believe, gave them some incorrect information because they were saying that all of the forested land um, was had gone to development. So in reality, the forested land, if you're looking at the Sankey diagram here, um, is gone to uh, developed um and herbaceous so um yeah, i got an email. yeah i got an email from one of the city councilors um and i shared the data with them 
So I, I have not heard back from them. And I invited them to come to our previous meeting if they wanted to see Ken's presentation on this, but I, I didn't, um, they, they never, res never responded to me. So, but, you know, see, it's just an example of sometimes how information can uh, not be interpreted mm -hmm. correctly. You know, that happens a lot. And it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure there was, it was not uh, no malice intended. It was just informational. So, but it definitely but, is, it definitely is concerning to me. But the good news is, though, the public is interested and activated. I mean, even if, if they're, you know, misinformed or don't totally understand, mm -hmm. this is an important piece to the public enough that they used it and followed through. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I mean, this is more information that we had before. And Kent, I can't thank you enough for doing this and spending this time and, you know, not only making these, um, making this wonderful report, but presenting it, um, you know, and, and doing all this work as a volunteer is in incredible. So I, yeah, I, again, I can't, I can't thank you enough. And um, what, Ken, when do you think the data for 2022 will be out? It'll be during the summer of 20. Um, I would not expect 20. that. It was, I mean, it has been, well, go back to this. For the tree canopy, well, they actually did every year. And they seem to be two years behind. So, yeah. you know, the 2021 tree canopy came out earlier this year. And the 2021 land cover came out very recently. So it looks like it's about two years behind. So maybe we'll get 2022 tree canopy sometime next year. And the land cover, if they're only doing that every two or three years, I wouldn't expect, you know, maybe there'll be 2023 data in 2025 or 2024 data in 2026, something like that. Um, but that's just my guess. Um, they actually, I. They, they're pretty responsive. I, when I was first working on this, I emailed to, um, I don't know, there's a contact person on here somewhere, um, and actually got a reply, and she was she was very helpful. I think I actually asked that question about when there might be an update. Um, but it looks like really it's every, it's about two years delay, seems to be typical, what's, what they're doing. Are there other um, ways that we could anticipate what the changes are going to be um, from year to year? Hmm. I mean, are there is there public information on you know how many new developments are happening or anything like that, or is it um, anything that? Um is going to be coming for the planning board is usually in um, you can access it from their, their website. Cause everything that they have to approve um, has to be done. Uh, planning board that is have to, you know, so anything that's not anything that's above 2000 square feet construction has to have a planning board approval either through the planning office or the full planning board itself, special permit right. site plan review. So that's where you would find, um, you know, that's where you would find these kinds of, um, that information, but it's, you know, I, I think the developer or the pers prospective developer will contact, um, the planning office and ask them, we are, we would like to do X, Y, and Z on X, Y, and Z property. What do we need to do? And then Carolyn or someone in the office would send them to their website and there's, you know, basically the whole website is set up so they can, you can file a whole application online um you know it's not really um i i sort of think some of the driver for all of this is the economy i think a lot of it has to do with the economy and the ability for um you know affordable housing to be constructed and right now you know with, with the interest rates where they are i think the housing market is cooling off um will that 
will that stop the um by right construction uh, for these uh you know density housing developments i don't i don't know the answer to that question housing is really so there's a, such a lack of housing um that i you know if the interest rates start to come down again i think you're probably going to see an uptick in more building um you know and and i think northampton is i think they've done a good job at actually trying to focus on um the uh density housing development versus um you know having uh, large swaths of land developed in uh, the more forested parts of the city, you know. So I think, I think they're, I think what they're, what they've put together is actually working. Um, it's just that I think uh, it's difficult for people to have the change, and it's also, you know, hard when you know you're losing a, a, a trees and they're the allies in the environment uh, with us and to, to this. But I mean, there's unfortunate trade offs, I guess. So. You know, and I and not to de deviate from what Kent's just showed us, but I'm sure you've been reading in the newspaper the couple of different. I think Leverett and Pelham both tried to pass uh, um, ordinances pertaining to uh, large ground-mounted solar arrays and forest and landscape. And the uh, <coughs> um, the general attorney's office, uh, there, sorry, the attorney general's office basically said that they both those ordinances were not uh, they weren't legal, so they had to go back to the drawing board. So I mean I you know I because there there is still no incentive for solar developers and these types of things to be built on existing oh. buildings or parking lots. That's what we need. Yeah. So that I mean that's a different conversation than this, but really it's sort of it is sort of the same because we have we have two very large ground mounted solar arrays in Northampton. One we lost forested land from and another one. Um, was mainly in an open was in it was in a field that was uh uh cultivated so but it's a lot of stuff to digest <clears throat> can those solar arrays be built in areas that are zoned rural or suburban uh that i don't i mean i would assume they can be because we're parked the solar rural the solar field in park hill road is in a rural area Mm. it's a rule it was rural zoned but it was agriculture it was a farm field mm. so i i don't you know i don't know the particulars of it but i just think again it's you know the 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 pressure is on for more housing and i think that this is just gives us more information and a follow-up for this i am going to meet with uh our uh gis coordinator sometime after the first of the year because I think the city is potentially thinking about doing another LIDAR project. So I need to get the information from her about um, if they are indeed going to do a new LIDAR project in 24 and if we could get, um, you know, the the uh, tree canopy coverage data out of that LIDAR, if, is, mm -hmm. if that is a uh, different um, module, you know. Do we have to yeah. yeah. So... I'll I'll follow up with her after the first of the first of the year. Rich, uh, I have a question about the. Sure, yeah, there's, there's a question for Kent here too, um, but in terms of the spatial resolution of lidar, is it is it thirty meters or, or less or more? Do you know? That I can't answer, Kent. I think it's generally more. I mean. Judging from the tree canopy maps that I've seen that are derived from LIDAR data, it at least can be more detailed. Um, I kind of think that that might be part of the, the, the contract, that you know maybe there's options for how detailed it is, and presumably more detailed is more expensive, um, and that would be part of the negotiations for the service, but I'm I'm not really sure. And that well and then following up the the um the MRLC data, which is at a 30 meter resolution, is that so that's the size of a basketball court, which is a substantial area. It's but pretty big, yeah. Yes. And so is that it are are the land cover 
determinations made by computer? It's, uh, yes, and, and people, I mean, it's not by somebody looking at it. They, they um, basically train like machine learning models to recognize the land cover is my understanding. Um, but unfortunately, if you really want to know the answer to that question, what you kind of need to do is come here and, you know, here's a quick overview, and then you have to start looking at their the papers. So it, it very quickly gets into a very technical description of the, of the process, and it's quite um, involved. So I don't, I can't answer your question uh, knowledgeably, but if you, if you really want to take the time uh, to know, I think you have to come and start looking at some of these papers on their website. Okay, will do. Thank you for the good, the great work. On the lineup question, Rich, I didn't you get at one point a copy of the um, the RFP from Cambridge for their LIDAR? And I kind of remember that there was a specification of the resolution in there, but I'm not sure. That would be one place to look, uh, David, to, to answer your other question about resolution and see. Um, I believe it was specified in that RFC, but I'm not certain. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with, with Karen, um, our GIS coordinator, and then I'll report back to you about the LIDAR aspect of it. Um, Kent, again, thank you very much for You're all welcome. the hard work uh, in putting this together. We um, we are all, I, I, speak, I can speak for the whole commission, we're very appreciative. Um, You're welcome, I'm glad it's useful. Any other follow-up questions before we go on to the next subject? Huge thanks, Kent. Um, okay, fall planting wrap up and spring 2024 update. Um, does Jen or Sue? No, look at that. Jen's like, no, I don't. I, I'm <laughs> putting me on the spot. Jen, where's that awesome? Where's that awesome um, flow chart? Oh, um, should be, uh, should be hanging behind you. Je Jess has it. She's gonna digitize okay. it. Okay. So we did right. have we did have a kind of a uh summary meeting. Uh, what Friday was that? That was the eighth. Uh, Friday the eighth. We we had a yeah, public eighth yeah, of we, December. Yep. And uh, I relayed the kind of report planting report that I gave to the um the commission on the 6th. So, and then there was some other people who were Tree Northampton volunteers that had expressed an interest of becoming more involved. So I had developed a kind of a flow chart of kind of jobs that we needed people to step up and do. And we got some, some people to cover. We have, uh, Christina's gonna do um, kind of head up, uh, setback plantings and um uh we have somebody who stepped up tom bassett stepped up to do um the dig safe <coughs> kind of process so um i had to hook him up with alicia but um we stopped right before thanksgiving because of uh weather <coughs> and uh Rich and I are going to meet to talk about or get in touch about going to the nursery and um, if that's still a possibility. And then also um, uh, to get a list of the, of the uh, takedowns and stump grinds so we can start like looking at um, looking at the uh, the sites, whether we can repopulate those as planting sites and um can I jump in? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we, um, some of the 
and we talked a lot about you know how we can better organize um the work that needs to be done in the absence of the two volunteers especially rob who was really working full time and um a few of us are going to get together and kent miles Jess and me, and look at how we're handling data right now um, on the Trina Northampton side and see if there's better ways to do that. Um, there was a system set up, but we, I think it could use a little bit of improvement. Um, one of the needs we identified was a group coordinator, someone who would really take on, um, I've been shouldering a lot of that, like for instance, when we have the rotary being the person available to the group leader um, to answer questions and be an intermediary and just a resource for them as, as they organize their group. So for instance, we have some neighborhoods, um, one in particular that we have a person who's interested in working with us, but they need a consistent person as a liaison to both the city and Tree Northampton. So that is a need um, and there's a fair amount of commitment involved because it's a lot of going back and forth. Another me need we um, identified is surrounding the maintenance program. Um, we've got Rich Parish is doing a wonderful job of leadership and organizing for the the tree training. But as far as um, there's a lot of trees that have mesh protecting protectors guards on them and the trees are expanding in size and girth and we feel like we need some kind of a system for like eyes on the trees to people who are going around and saying you know this tree needs weeding this you know section by section we're not exactly sure how to how to go about that we also have kind of stakes that were put up when the tree was first planted in large part to keep people from parking on top of them and um, mowing them down and so forth. And together with those mesh protectors, we anecdotally see that they need, you know, we pull over when we see one that's become detached or something, but we don't have a systemic way like we are starting to have with the pruning of looking at that. And that is gonna be a lot of our future. We talked about how um, we've really have fewer and fewer places where we do full street plantings. We need, um, another need we have is um, to expand our, our leader pool because we're finding more and more we have a meetup and then the group of volunteers break off and they'll have one tree here and one tree there. And that's kind of the low hanging fruit is gone. Aside for some nice big projects we'll have for like Arbor Day and Earth Day mm -hmm. at where we have one site and a lot of trees and we can get the bare root and do that. But more and more we need to have kind of planting leaders who maybe work in teams. So we had a few people who said that they'd be willing to um, take on more of that, which is a really positive thing. So we did codify some people who were going to be taking on a little bit more. And we also identified some areas where um, we need, we still need to, to grow and find people. Maintenance and um, group leaders were two of those areas. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've um, come a ways. And um, if you know people who you think would be, interested in those areas please let us know or if the public ends up watching this and there are people interested um get in touch yeah the project coordinator um uh you know everyone would have you know it wouldn't just be that person there would be a hopefully a group of people that could be called upon volunteers and i think the project those special projects are where we're going to have potential of large plantings. And I think Molly of uh, you know, we've talked several times about the um about the uh, Hampshire Heights. You know, um there's huge there is there is very large effective 
areas that we could put in some trees um, there. But that would take somebody to say, that's my project and I'm going to go figure out who we need to talk to and <laughs> you know follow up and then refer back and we can mm. get the trees and you know so it just takes like a point person to really do that kind of thing and that it made me think about that uh, when Kent I read through the um information that uh Kent had sent out about the urban trees and you know the you know we all know that you know low income neighborhoods tend to not have as many trees and so anyway that i think that is a, a key place uh to be pretty effective in um you know having these larger plantings but so you were going to ask a question sorry me mm -hmm. yes um it's just making me percolate my thoughts are percolating um i was thinking that that job of checking the the mesh you know stockings around the trees that would be a perfect job for somebody on a bicycle to do that job should be done by bicycle. That would be the perfect way to do it. And so then I was thinking, oh, maybe people, maybe there's somebody from Mass Bike, you know, who would enjoy biking around and checking the trees if we gave them a list of specific trees and, a, you know, training of what to check for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then this thing about, you know, um, project coordinator for certain places like Hampshire Heights. Um, there's some kind of, I get these emails every once in a while about, volunteer opportunities in the Northampton area. I can't remember who sends them to me, but there's some kind of like list of organizations that are looking for specific volunteers. And if we could write up or Tree Northampton could write up um, like these specific jobs, like one, you know, bicycle around and check the tree, blah, blah, blah. Two, you know, project coordinator for this, we need you to do this. this, this. Maybe there's people like looking for volunteer opportunities who would like to take on a specific task like that. That's a great idea. Do you have, do you think you have any of those in your email trash or something you could find? I'm going to have to wait for the next one to come through. Okay. Yeah. When, forward the, it to me. Watch, when the next one comes through, I'll notice like, what is this organization again that is doing it and figure out more info. That's, That's a great terrific. idea. Yeah, that is a great idea. And um, I wanted to also comment on um, in low income neighborhoods. There, I've read a couple of articles on how important it is to have for the residents themselves to be involved and to have a sense of control or influence on these projects. And that there have been some um, situations where groups or or municipalities have kind of bulldozed through and not mostly not communicating um so just want to Good throw point. that in there as if we're going to you know target certain areas to, to be respectful and mindful that you know people live in those that's somebody's home even if they don't own it and that um we really need to think about how we're commu ways to communicate. Um, there was one example in a city where the city came in and cut down trees and they cut them down because there was a disease, but the people in the neighborhood interpreted it as just having their trees taken away. And then when they came back in to plant trees, there was a lot of friction. Cause it sounds like Warfield place. Historic um, <laughs> animosity. No, it was like Philadelphia or somewhere where um, the neighborhood had been, no one had explained any of it along the way. And, but you're right. I suppose that was La Roa Trees. But um, I wonder if those housing areas have a tenants organization or tenants ever have meetings, you know, that would be something to find out and see if we could attend one of their meetings to talk about it. We need somebody to sort of research yeah, I, that. Yeah, I would assume like the per, you know, that would be, that was my vision of part of this special projects coordinator to yeah. have a like a team of people who mm -hmm. they would say, we're going to target these things. And it, you know, it might take six months to figure it out or however long. I mean, Rob worked on, I mean, my goodness, David worked on the schools 
you know, we were trying to get in there forever. And I don't know yeah. what kind of special sauce you have, David, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so that, yeah. that was kind of a yeah. perfect example, Jen, the schools, right. You know, right. and even the, you know, the tree program is in part very much a municipal program and schools are municipal. It still took years. So mm -hmm. when you're working with other entities from the private sector, it can be even, you know, longer, I think. And I have a little list of, uh, short list of you know projects that are kind of sitting out there waiting for somebody to kind of take on make the you know find out about so so molly's idea is really great of finding a way to basically maybe not just that email but finding a way to articulate and and publicize these yeah. specific needs i, I imagine okay. there's somebody out there who would love they'd love that job ride their bicycle around and check on trees. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's somebody in Northampton who'd want to do that. I could work on on trying to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're Rich raising your hand, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be retired soon. So my I, I might go. come back as the Perfect. the uh, the uh tree guard pedal person. Got it. <laughs> great, great exercise. <laughs> um and I think that would be good to have someone because if we end up using the tree, if we end up using the tree diapers and they're successful, we were not, you know, obviously we're not going to use them in an area that floods, uh, but uh, we, we will not need to be going to the tree, you know, watering the trees with a gator bag and examining them, you know, once a week, like we normally do. But um, I have a question for you, Rich. Sure. Um, a, a, a couple of times we we've brought up the idea of having a new inventory done mm -hmm. of the city trees. And it certainly wouldn't be as costly as the initial one because the, it would be verifying and updating information rather than repopulating the entire thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what would the timeline for that be? And could, could something like that actually capture the debt, the maintenance data on the trees that we've planted. Um, yeah, I mean the maintenance, like the maintenance data for the new trees or the maintenance, it'd be like re maintenance recommendations would be um, a tree, you know, young tree train. It's not going to be any really more specific than you know, young tree train, which is basically pruning uh, for you know for. Uh, structure and architect you know architecture and mitigating uh risk for branch failure in young trees um to answer the bigger question i actually had a conversation today with donna about uh, an inventory and i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to reach out to davy resource group and actually see what a what a quote would be um because they were the vendor we used before um, as to whether or not they would could do a, tr a tree inventory, a full tree inventory again. But, a, but like you said, Sue, we already have a lot of the, uh, we have the whole template. We have many of the same, you know, the site IDs are all constructed. Um, so the question is, is that, uh, you know, what would be the cost? And then of course, do we want a, a management plan in the end, or do we just want the raw inventory updated? So, um, because I do think it would be, it is important to have that inventory because we are having um, canopy decline, you know, in the form of mortality of a lot of these uh, over mature and over mature trees that we have. So, uh, and a lot of nori maples and the nori maples are not mature. They are, well, I would say they're probably between adolescent and mature, whatever that may be. <laughs> Um, but, uh, they are just, a lot of the maples are declining. So, um, and I also think that we, we can, because of the type of services that the inventory is under mass procurement laws, we do not have to do an RFP. So it's considered engineering services. So for example, when you want to hire an engineer, um, to do, uh, an engineering design of something, um, under mass procurement laws, you can hire the engineering firm. 
um, just using the, the normal contract, but you don't have to put out a solicitation. So the last time we, because we anticipated it was going to be over $49,000, the inventory had to go in the central register and it had to sit out there for two weeks and we had people all over the country bidding on it. This time around, we can just approach the vendor that we used and said, you know, would you be willing to do a tree inventory in 2024? Um, and how much would it cost? And, you know, here's the estimated amount of trees that we are aware of now because we've planted like 2,000 trees and we want to capture, you know, 1,000 tree planting sites or we want to uh, include the school grounds as well. You know, so there's different things we can do, but it would be curious. I, I want to know how much it's going to cost to do it. Yep. And then what we could do is um, we could apply for a DCR matching grant. You know, so I think yep. they're up, they're up to forty thousand forty thousand now. So anything and that we should just have on our radar for like, you know, it's got to be even though you know we could, you know, we already did one. We could use that as a template, but really that needs to be, in my opinion, like started to be thought about in like August. So whoever's gonna because we have to have the proposal in sometime in october right first and, yes yeah october 1st so that's you know that's i think i think that just need if we're gonna do it we need to just so whoever's going to be writing that up that isn't like really under the gun to you know and has to do a good job with it so they need you know you need at least a month to be able to yeah I kind of steered us away from the topic at hand, which is really the um, um, like the the meeting we had about how volunteers are engaged. Um, but there's always behind that, like the data flow, like how, what is the workflow for these volunteers? You know, if there's where does the list come from, or how do they document what they're doing so that it's meaningful and helpful to the city, and not just like a separate, you know, set of information i don't know molly um regarding that tree inventory it totally makes sense to hire davy again because because they have the template you know we don't want to hire somebody new anyway to start the whole thing from scratch but i think before we think about doing that i think we need to um get really clear about what exactly we're looking to find out and why like mm -hmm what exactly are we trying to get from this inventory or, and are we comparing it in some way to the the past one like what you know what are the specific questions like kent you know in his re, his thing that he did he did specific analyses and comparisons of x to z or whatever but what are we trying to find out why are we why are we doing it and that would be part of what we would ask like if they're going to do any kind of data analysis besides just the inventory what exactly kind of analysis do we want and why? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that uh, they they could do a level of analysis um, from the previous di uh, inventory they did, um, like species, uh, you know, the species profile, condition rating, risk rating. Um, but I think in order to get the kind of information that you're looking for, that would expand the RFP to something different. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is that does it, uh, how, you know, how does it, does it, is Davy the right, is Davy the right um, group to actually mm -hmm. do that work? You know, so mm -hmm. I think really good, really good question. Good, good thing to think about. Um, but in, in the interim, I will, have a conversation or I'll send an email to uh, Josh at Davy resource group and see, you know, what it looks. I, I, I'm also will reach out to the community that had Davy and they just did a new inventory. I want to see what it took to get it done. Mm -hmm. so. Thank but, you Rich, for looking into that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, um, you're welcome. And um, I'm, we're a little off topic and a little, sorry. Time. No, no, it's, no, it's okay. It's fine. It's a group. It's all trees. It's good. You know, it's always a good topic, right? You can never go wrong with trees. So, um, but I, I had put on, um, I had put on our, uh, agenda tree note, tree notes email from Kent at the request of Molly, because Molly wanted to talk about some of the links and things that were in that email, that, um, email that Kent sent. So Molly, I'm not sure if you, 
have well, like specific questions or no i didn't have specific things but it's just i was frustrated because you know here are these articles that are of interest to us but no opportunity to even like we had to even, mm, couldn't say anything about them so if there's now's our opportunity to discuss the articles if we feel like it's something worth discussing um you know i don't know if that you know that program that she has about the heat island and stuff it looks like the data they have is just for boston i don't know if we could even get data for here but like is that something that is would be useful for us or what or what thoughts do people have about that well first of all i i can say one thing is that um i don't see an issue with discussing these things i only see an issue if these things are going to be uh, voted upon by the commission. So say, for example, that we were going to use, um, uh, we were going to do something, uh, we we're going to use one of these data apps or something on here, and then we actually brought it to the commission to vote on it, we would end up actually have violated the open meeting law because we would have discussed it outside of open meeting. Right. So if you have thoughts about... Um, any of these things that are on here, I don't see why you can't discuss them. Um, I mean, the reply all thing is like, is, is strict, you know, it's just to keep us in check so we don't make the mistake of replying all for something that we actually are going to vote on. Um, Wait, I'm confused. I'm hearing two things. We can discuss them as a group, you, even so, if it, it so, might eventually lead to a vote about whether no, we want to do it or you not. You cannot. You cannot. If it is going to lead to a vote, you cannot discuss it. Well, we don't know if it's going to lead to a vote. Oh, but... then maybe we should just forget about what I just said and we'll just <laughs> talk about it right here then. Because All right, but I see what you're saying. If it's something that's yeah. nothing that's ever going to be voted on, we could talk about right. it. Yep. Some thoughts. Um, those were super interesting. And, um, you know, kind of, I mean, maybe I'm just too old fashioned to like really uh, be able to think about how to use the data, I think, um, you know, like which side the shade is on and stuff like that. Like, that's what I read, you know, I was like kind of reading through the articles and what I was thinking of, you know, somebody who has some experience in this industry could go on a street and tell you which, you know, where the shade is or going to be, or, I mean, I, I, I guess I didn't. And, and I was thinking, I mean, maybe I'm not understanding the full use of it probably. You but mean the 3D I, imagery? Yeah, there was, there was a couple. And yeah. also just, I mean, I thought it was cool that, that the thing you could go look at to pick a tree, that was kind of amazing. Um, but also, um, uh also just um you know my experience well even with davy tree like they gave us all these sites to plant and then you know we're, you still have to go look at them anyway you know you have to but i guess that's not such a bad thing because you get a list and then you can go out and and do, you know, you're right, Jen. They didn't take into consideration sight lines or vehicles, and that you would never plant a tree and a lot right. of those sites because it wouldn't be safe. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the human being goes out there, and you can say, "Wow, there's a big hole in the canopy right here," and right. But if it could give you alerts of, "Oh, here's 50 places that are open." And then you just go around and look at, you know, it's kind of like the stump grind list I get. You know, I go around and look at these sites and some of the places, you know, I know why they're the tree failed and the stump got ground and you don't want to put another one in there, you know. But sometimes there are spaces, you know, so. Um, yeah, and I wondered like who, like if we use these things, like who, again, it's like who's going to handle that you know who's gonna facilitate it or something you know like yeah 
Yeah. So. Yeah. Once you, once you have data, you, it has to be managed. Yeah. You know, like the inventory, like I, today I was working uh, in the, in the inventory because of the, of the tree, um, the trees and the work that had to be done the last two days because of the, the storm that we had, you know, so I also went back through there and called through the whole list of stumps and made sure that all the trees that we removed this year, I, I swapped them over. So they're now vacant sites. Some of them, some of them, um, I list them as vacant sites, but I, we can't plant there because of where the tree, there's no point in planting there. It's not plausible. But I mean, you, you know, the inventory is like, um, it's not static. You know, it, it's constantly having to be updated. It's constantly changing. Conditions of trees are changing. Um, the same thing with all the pruning we've been doing. You know, I have to go back with the mature trees that were captured in the canopy in two, uh, the inventory in 2016. I have to you know, have the services that were done to them, um, you know, uh, documented. So it, it's a lot. It, it's one per it's, that's like a full-time job. So, you know, and I also have, <clears throat> I had, um, Abby helped me out and she put together the whole stump list. So it's in, it's in an Excel sheet at this point. So I have to send that to you, but you know, that's a whole, you know, so all this data has to be managed. And I, I would, I'm going to tell you off the bat that I, you know, I am not an expert. I am, uh, the, the ability for me to use a computer and the data, <laughs> the, the limited data capacity I have is all sort of self-taught. So there's a lot of other people out there that have way better data skill sets. I'm not going to mention them. there's one on the computer right now on the screen. Um, KJ. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I, th I think it's great to do these, to, to go through these exercises and see if some of these things are applicable to what we want. But the question is, is that how do we manage it? You know, how, what, what do we do with all the information? Right. That's you know? why I brought up that that those yeah. points about the inventory. Yeah. No, I, I, I think they're, I think they're great. I think they're great points. You know, um, I think the commission's always struggled with having. You know, lots of ideas, but um, you know, there's limited staff on the city side and limited volunteer hours. So the challenge of, you know, what is our biggest impact? Our biggest impact is when we plant and care for trees, and how do we put as much time as possible into that specifically? I think yeah. it's cool. I appreciate being able somebody curate this series of of articles and stuff because it's in it's important to know what's out there what people are doing and you know absolutely especially locally like in boston and cambridge and you know they're figuring some stuff out in very difficult conditions and uh but they again they have like you know more resources than we do but um you know i wouldn't have even been aware of oh this is the way data is being used now to you know, choose trees or to help people get active. I thought that was really cool about the Giving Tuesday thing. Yes. That was amazing mm -hmm. to to um suggest giving a piece of your yard to plant a tree. That yeah. is like no cost, you know, that was that was brilliant. That was we should, what a great idea. We should keep that in mind for our setback plantings. Yeah. yeah. That's a great, a great angle. Yeah, I mean, there there are a tremendous amount of uh, articles um, that are available that are, you know, I'm just looking at one right now from you, Green. It's called The Power of Green Spaces, How Parks and Public Spaces Promote Happiness and Health. You know, there's so much information, um, and this is probably a lot of information that we probably already know, but I think that uh, there are just, there's so much more information available today than there was when we started at least my in my corner of the world um that it's really amazing and the question is is that what do we do with all this information and all the tools um i think we've been really super successful as a commission though because we've we have done a lot of basic we've done a lot of basic work we've also done a lot of hard work a lot of work with the ordinance changes um but i'm just 
I, I don't really know how we would manage all di different data. I mean, I think having an inventory starting off and having inventory done over again, I think is extremely important. I think before we do all that, though, we need to have a conversation about what we want out of the inventory. So we make sure we ask the vendor the right questions. Um, and then I need to follow up with the LIDAR data information. Um, and, you know, again, um, I never really had a response from... Um, University of uh, University of Vermont at Burlington in regards to the um, the spatial analysis data. So I could always sort of rattle that email again and see if they'd be what they would be willing to do for us as well, you know. But, and of course, we've talked about the um, forest management plan too, as something. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think all these things. Our agenda again. Yes, I think all these things tie into that. So. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, information to be um, captured and maintained and and utilized, um, but there's also a lot of work to do that's not related to, you know, d digital technology. So, but the re having it, someone can you having you, you know give us articles to help us with our awareness is really valuable and appreciated. And we thank you. Mm -hmm. It's good to know, because I don't want to be bugging you with stuff that's not of interest. And that doesn't help anybody. I'll, I'll like, keep sending things. Yeah, keep yeah, keep sending them. Them. yeah, keep sending them. And we might not all like, um, well, A, we're, we're not, we can individually reply to you on these things so people keep that in mind and um and it's our jobs to be paying attention and you're helping us and i'm happy if anybody ever wants to have an individual discussion about something i send out let me know thank you ken thank again you. uh we have mm -hmm. one minute I just want to say I'm interested in the bicycle mesh removal thing. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm somewhat tied into the bicycling community in Northampton. So I might possibly be able to find some other people to do that if there was actually like a protocol and a, and a list of locations. Mm -hmm. so, so, Kent, maybe in January, as part of the meeting of looking at um, having you look at the tree tracker that we use as we cite trees and keep track oh. of our inventories of the trees. Maybe you could also, maybe we could brainstorm about how do we tackle this situation where we have a city with all these streets, we have newly planted trees, we want somebody to go look at and then document in a certain way yeah. so that we can and then figure out the tasks yeah. to be done. Yeah, so that's a really good topic. How to how to organize it and manage the data and the data, the flow of data and updating. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to um you know be a resource to, you know I have a I have my own way of thinking about oh should I just open the bottom should I take the whole thing off should I turn it the other way should it you know, um we just did that at uh today when we were pruning it uh, in front of Cooley Dickinson Hospital. So, um, uh, that's yeah. invaluable. So there's several things. There's like how to manage it. And there would be phase one would be like starting to look at streets and identify what work. And then we actually need people to be told what exactly to do, do when they go yeah. out. Yeah, I could do quick little training it's not yeah. hard but okay. yeah oh we're yeah. 601 i'm blabbing that's okay uh i just wanted to say one thing before we uh one thing i forgot to mention earlier is that uh mastery wardens and foresters association is uh puts on three to four professional development series um every year and one of the professional development series they're looking at doing a, a on online pds uh for um with communities that have uh like tree partners like tree northampton um and i was wondering and I, sue i can reach to you uh offline about this which i will 
um, about your if Tree Northampton would be one of uh, the interested parties. So what we'd be looking for would be, uh, let me just find what they were asking for the inbox. Uh, so um, they're looking to do a working with Tree Advocacy Group PDS, where it would be an online PDS, and we would have multiple tree advocacy groups um, actually doing like a roundtable discussion. And they're the moderator. So um, that's going to be okay. All right. I'll, I'll reach out to you and then we can put it on a future agenda if it sounds like something you'd like to do. So um, about two to three communities uh, would talk about their experiences with the tree advocacy group. So so that I think our commission would be a good commission to actually be part, participate in that. For That's the next all. agenda, does it make sense to put on the next agenda this topic about the bicycle and you sure. know, maintenance data management thing? Or is that something more for a subcommittee? Uh, I don't know. Why don't you? Th I'm OK with putting it on the agenda, you know, we're, but we're going to need some time to probably hash it out. So I wouldn't want to I want to put it on an agenda that doesn't have a lot of information, a lot of yeah. other items. So it would need then, to be maybe in February or something. We're going yeah. to start thinking about it in January. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be, I'm trying to get Tree City USA squared away next week. So I don't, mm. uh, oh, I, good. Think I, I think I have most of the data I need. So, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to Molly, send me some suggestions about what you want on the January 3rd agenda or any, any of the commissioners that want anything on the January 3rd uh, agenda would be great. Would be helpful. I don't have any ideas. Oh, yeah. I know, and I and I keep I email you, but I haven't emailed you in the last couple of meetings because we've had to adjust things, and I it's just uh, we're well, just repeating things from what we weren't able to discuss in the previous meeting. Actually, so one one topic that hasn't ha keeps getting put off is about setback plantings, and like okay. approaching that whole next phase of planting. Sure. Yep. And then, David, are you uh planning on? Are you working uh, with Jordan about the um, the setback um, bushes? Bush, or what I call them, shrubs. Yeah, yeah, shrubs. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we haven't. Yes, I'm working with Jordan on that. Okay. All right. So basically, I can do that for our next meeting. I'll send a little email out to just ask for some suggestions. That'll be one of them. Um, and then anything else that folks want to talk about. Okay. Just just let me know, okay? All right. Anyone else have anything that's not anticipated by the chair? No, okay. Uh, then I guess uh, I have a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Uh, is there a I second? I can second it. All right, all in favor, just uh, mm -hmm. no, there's no discussion. Thank you, everyone.